Welcome to the Game Before the Money podcast, celebrating pro and college football history. This episode, Minnesota Vikings legend Chuck Foreman. Hi everyone, I'm Jackson Michael. I recently interviewed Minnesota Vikings legend Chuck Foreman. He started at fullback for the Vikings under head coach Bud Grant and made five Pro Bowls and helped the Vikings make it to three Super Bowls. Chuck Foreman played his last season in the NFL with the New England Patriots. Foreman grew up in Frederick, Maryland, which is in the Baltimore, D.C. area. He attended Frederick High School. Chuck told me that his high school football coach went to college with Lenny Moore. How about that? Pretty neat connection there. Foreman played multiple positions in high school. He will tell you more about that in the interview. Chuck Foreman played college football at the University of Miami. He played multiple positions there as well. Minnesota drafted Foreman in the first round of the 1973 NFL draft. He was the 12th overall pick in that draft. And he was named Sporting News Rookie of the Year and also the AP Offensive Rookie of the Year. His nickname was the Spin Doctor. He had this incredible spin move. He was very difficult to tackle, especially in the open field. He scored 22 touchdowns in a 14-game season. Put that together. 22 touchdowns in a 14-game regular season. Foreman scored at least 14 touchdowns in three straight seasons, which means he averaged a touchdown per game for three straight seasons. Very few people have done that for three straight seasons in NFL history. I discussed that more in episode 65 of the Game Before the Money podcast, which featured Sean Alexander. Chuck Foreman was a great receiver as well as a running back. He led the entire NFL in receptions in 1975 and gained over a 1,000 yards rushing. In the same season, he led the NFL in touchdowns for two seasons. He famously wore number 44 for the Vikings and is a member of the Vikings Ring of Honor. Don't forget to visit the gamebeforethemoney.com for more great football history. And here is the Game Before the Money interview with Chuck Foreman. Did you start playing? in high school or, or did you get into it before? No, I, you know, we had the little, what they call midget football league and all that kind of stuff. And then you went to high school and played, you know, the way it always evolved when you, you know, in the fourth, fifth, sixth grade, and then you go on to junior high school and high school, just like that. Like everybody else. And, um, were you a multi-sport athlete, or or did you just focus on football? No, man. Back in the back in my time, you with the football season was in. You played football, basketball. You played basketball, track or baseball. You know, it was just the way it was. Was was football your your main sport? I was pretty good at all sports. I, you know, so yeah, like I said, we whichever season was in, that was the that was the sport we played. What college offers did you have, and why did you choose Miami? Oh, man, you name the college, I could have went to it. So I chose Miami because I enjoyed my recruiting trip, and I liked the school, I liked the town. Just simple things like that, the beach, the water, that's pretty much it. I saw you mentioned that you played uh, defensive backs on in college, too. Right, I sure did. Uh I played pretty much running back, wide receiver, and corner. Oh, and so did, did playing receiver, is that how you developed your receiving skills? Did that help quite a bit? I played tight end and defensive tackle in high school. Um, how can I explain it to you? 
I was an athlete. Everybody I grew up with was an athlete. You could run it, you could catch it, you could throw it. There was nothing we couldn't do. Uh, now, there may have been people out there, but, you know, I grew up in an era whereas, you know, if my coach called me and said, told me one day, Chuck, you're going to play quarterback, I would have played quarterback. If he told me to play defensive tackle, which I did, had so many great athletes you played where they told you to play. So the answer to your question is uh, I was an athlete. I was a football player, and I don't think there was any position I couldn't play. But like I said, in my time, when I grew up, that was the way it is. Now you got young people, when they play football, you know, they play one position. That's it. You know, every now and then you might get a guy that might play offense and defense, but generally they play one. They play quarterback. They play wide receiver. So it's a different time. Uh, than the athlete you were used to watching. You know, I, like I said, we were athletes. You know, we were not just football players or we don't, we didn't just play one position. When I went to the University of Miami, I went to play football. It didn't matter what position they put me at because I would have probably been the best at it anyway because that's how, how I challenged myself. But that's so you understand the, the, uh, the times that when you're talking to me and maybe people in my time frame, or well, my era, you'll have to understand that generally, you know, we all played several positions. You know, I wasn't just, uh, you know, whether it's basketball, football, track, you know, you just did what your coach told you to do. And, it, you know, now to everybody specialized, you know, you know, you, like you just said to me, oh, did you, you play one, you know, that position? No, man, I played them all. And I just happened to end up playing running back. But in college, I played everything. So that's that's the athlete of my era. That was a great description of it, too. Um, and just how you grew up. And, and that that speaks to just how you were an all-around player, too. It, it, that, that really kind of describes as to how you became such a, such a great all-around player. Athletes in my era... I think you can define us as athletes, you know. I, I guess that's the only way I can put it. You play where they ask you to play. And when uh, you were drafted by the Vikings in the in the first round and, and you show up to training camp, did Bud Grant tell you, we're going to try you out at different positions, or, or did they have you pegged at running back? When they drafted me and I was in a meeting with uh, the general manager, Jim Fink, he asked me at that point where I want to play. And I told him I'd. I played running back because I had made, at that point, I had made, I had won every MVP in every game I played and as a running back. So that was why I made that choice. And uh, in your first game, you score a touchdown against the Raiders um, that put, uh, put the Vikings ahead by one point, I think. Um, do you, what do you remember about that, that first, your first NFL game? I don't, you know, like I say, man, to me, they're all the same. Um, nothing special other than the fact getting in the huddle for the first time and uh, realizing that I was finally in the NFL playing in a regular season football game, and I did not start my first game at all. So, uh, but I did end up coming in right after, you know, the first two series, so. Yeah, and the Vikings won... Um you know, the first nine games of your pro career, which is a, it's a bet, as good a start as you could you could have. Yeah, I'd, I'd say it was a good start. You know, like I, all those details you're talking to me about, I really never really paid much attention to them. I mean, other than the fact that I knew, you know, we had good football teams. They were very, uh, how can I put it, it was a mature football team when I got here. Those guys had already been in the league probably eight, nine years, and uh, I was just another piece to the puzzle and a uh, different piece, I guess you can say, they put through the puzzle, and we were able to do some things other teams couldn't. I think our our offensive coordinator was uh, a bit more uh, creative, let's say, as far as using me in different places and doing different things, wide receiver, slot back, running back, all those things. 
you know, the NFC Central back in those days, they called it the black and blue division. Um, mm-hmm. How would how would you describe those divisional games against other games and, and other rivalries that you had? Well, I would say that they were a little more physical for sure. Uh, it was known as the toughest division in my time anyway. Uh, Chicago, Green Bay, Detroit, you know, Minnesota Vikings. You know, the black and blue was there long before I got there, but I got to experience And, of course, the veterans on the team explained to all of us, you know, the importance of uh, the games. And generally, you know, the Green Bay Packers were the top team and the Vikings at the time. And Chicago and Detroit, they were good teams, but not they didn't win much. You, and I guess you you must have played against Dick Buckus your rookie year. Yeah, I, I played against him. But at that time, Dick was, you know, playing pretty much on one leg. His knees were bad and still tough and everything, but he couldn't get around like he used to. And um, so the version of Dick Buckus I got to play against it wasn't the Dick Buckus that was the most dominant player in the NFL because of that. He, he he is one of the most dominant players in NFL history. But when I when I got to play against him, he you know he had some injuries, and of course back then you have a knee injury that was a major major situation. Uh, now you have an injury like that, you know they go and fix it. You might be better than you were when you started. So um, it's a big difference. Well, and then also the Bears in in '75 they got Walter Payton and. Um, mm-hmm. You and Walter Payton, definitely the premier backs in that division. Um, how 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 much did the two of you interact and talk about rushing and, and that sort well, of thing? You know, man, like I said, we never interacted at all. Um, you know, I think the only time Walter and I really, we went to this, did this competition someplace called the Super Speed. We never the Bahamas or someplace. Walter was a great guy. Uh, Ricky Young and um, uh, Ricky, I got to play with Ricky Young who played with Walter Payton at Jackson State. And Walter, when I did get to know him and get around, just a wonderful, beautiful person. But as far as us competing, you know, uh, he was, like I said, you no, know, I got out of rest, Walter thing or something like that. Uh, but like that. It was more of a team I was worrying about winning, not worrying about competing against Walter Payton. Oh, okay. You had um, you had a great game against the Bears, um, in '77 with the 150 yards rushing, and um, I think he had a, a lot of yards receiving that day. You hit you you were the kind of the original all-purpose back. Well, I would say that maybe I took it to a different level, but before me, there was a guy by the name, uh, when I was a kid, there was a guy named Bobby Mitchell, all-purpose, there was a gentleman by the name of Lenny Moore, all-purpose, and then when I was in college, there was a guy named Jim Kick, all-purpose, there could be a lot more, but those were the ones that I watched that were pretty much all-purpose backs and um, could do pretty much everything. I just happened to take it to a different level. Yeah, you certainly did. You know, in in 1975, you know, you had three touchdowns in back to back games, and uh, you had three touchdowns in in five games. Was was everything just clicking for you, or or was the offense designed for you to score a lot? Or no, man, that's not the way it works, man. It's like as a receiver, as a running back, as a quarterback, the so called skill position people. The only way we had success. And to get to do the things that we can do that can showcase our individual skills is is, is if you have the people in, in place that is going to give you what you need. Like, for instance, as a running back, is this lineman going to give me the opportunity to, to get to the second level where my individual skill set will come in uh, for the quarterback? Is he going to get the time to throw the football, to, to read the defense, to do it up for the wide receiver? Is he going to run the right pattern and identify what defense is coming in the quarterback read and, and get the ball to him? And all that takes, you know, it's, it's what's up front that counts. Uh, without the linemen on the offensive or defensive side, 
nothing happens. Now the linebackers, the running backs, the receivers, the corners, they get all the all the ink. But the guys that make it happen are the guys up front. Now that's how I visualize football and the way I think about football. So, uh, you, you know, what do I do? Uh, when you ask me about the games that I had three touchdowns in, then that tells tells me that the offensive line was doing what they were supposed to do and I was doing what I was supposed to do. So it's, I wish I could take that individual accomplishment. Certainly my individual, my, my, my talents come into play. But my talents don't come into play unless everybody else is doing their thing. You see, that's that's just the way to go. Right. You had some, some great guys in, in front of you with – with Mick Tinglehoff and uh, Ron Yeri are both in the Hall of Fame. and You know, one game that really stands out that you were a part of and just the entire team had a great game was in the 77 playoffs against the Rams in the, in the Mud Bowl. Um, right. Yeah, could you talk about playing in those conditions and, and, and what made you so successful in that? Well, you know... That particular game is a game when uh, everybody picked the Los Angeles Rams to win. And obviously the weather was bad, the rain was bad, the field was bad. It was the conditions that we were used to playing in in Minnesota because we played in bad weather all year round. We knew how to run in the snow. We knew how to run in the mud. You know, we knew how to do all that kind of stuff. So that particular, even though it was nice and warm, but, you know, the weather was terrible. You know, the field was terrible. And, you know, you just got to know how to adjust to those conditions. And we obviously were able to do that. And um, we had one heck of a football game. Of course, you guys making the Super Bowl three times during your career and four times for, for a lot of the guys. You know, a lot of people obviously look at the Super Bowls, but... Winning, you know, three NFC Championship games, that's remarkable in itself. How would you define that team and its success? Well, you know, I guess the first Super Bowl they played in, I was in high school watching it at home. Right. You know what I mean? And then uh, four or five years later, I'm playing in one with those same guys. So um, I know the excitement and what I was going through to get there. You know, and then they, the more you win, the more exciting you get. And then the playoffs are, on the, are coming, and then you're trying to get seated in the playoffs. And then, you know, it's one game and out, and then the pressure's there. You know, it's more intense every game you play. And, and then you get to the Super Bowl, which is supposed to be the ultimate game, and you fizzle. And that's exactly what we did. He time somehow was, uh, I don't know, bad karma or whatever you want to call it, but. You know, we just weren't on our game. But you guys, of course, remarkable team, especially in the 70s. You had a remarkable individual career that has, personally, I believe it's been overlooked. I, I remember the last few years of your career was about when I started watching football. Mm-hmm. I was old enough to start watching. And, you know, you had you had tremendous games. And we're definitely, on that offense, the uh, the spark plug. Now that you look back over over your individual career, what what kind of goes through your mind? You know, I I don't know. I don't really go back and think about all that until I'm asked about it. But it was a great experience. It certainly was all that. It was, of course, memorable and a great ride and a lot of great uh, moments and met a lot of nice people along the way. And um, I guess I'm one of the blessed ones that got to play against the best, be one of the best, experience the Super Bowls, even though we didn't win. Like I said, a lot of nice people I met. And um, and to be quite honest with you, to be able to still be out there and uh, be a part of the football fraternity is, you know, I think that's a blessing in itself, so it's all good for me. All right. Is there anything else important? Well, I don't know. I, you know, I, I appreciate the call and everything, but 
you know, as I said, you know, if I had to say anything, when you look at football players or athletes in general, um, you got to look at the time and the era in which they play. I certainly don't compare my era to the football player or the era of today because it's a totally different game, a totally different everything as far as uh, the game itself is concerned. You know, the rule changes, you know, the number of games you play, the protections that they have in for the players now that they didn't have in back then, the offenses, and, you know, you, you know, it was in the, at a time when they were converting from, you know, run dominating offense to opening the game up to a passing, a passing game too. Uh, all kinds of things that, you know, that I experienced in my time. And then when I watch the game today, see, I can't compare, for instance, I don't compare statistics of today to statistics back when I played. Well, number one, there's 14 games. Number two, the rule changes. Number, There's so many different things uh, that that players can do now that they couldn't do back then. And just a total approach to the game of football is different. So each era it should be judged differently. I don't believe in the word GOAT. I don't think there ain't no greatest of all times. You might be the greatest of your era, but you can't say that you're the greatest of all time because, number one, you know, well, you can't judge it by yards you make or how many catches you make, you know, because those things are different. When my era... When uh when a guy when we played football for instance as a wide receiver they had the bump and run in which meant that the guy could get up on you and bump you all the way downfield until that ball was released. Now they can't touch you, so if you can't get out and catch you know a hundred balls, then you you know I don't know why you can't because it's easy to do. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, and it took a long time for uh, anybody except Lionel Taylor and Charlie Hennigan to have over 100 catches. So when you go back and you're doing your homework, which it sounds like you've done a lot of it, I'm just saying when you are talking about players in the game itself, think about before you say who's the greatest and who can do this and who can do that, you know, that's the, the ultimate team sport this game of football and everything any individual does, he ain't done it on his own. Certainly he showcases some individual talents, whether he can catch the ball, run a route, uh, can run the football and all that kind of stuff. But all the people that are involved for him to be able to showcase that, you got to remember that the rules have changed. For instance, offensive linemen hold every play now. The only difference is, you know, you can't have your hands outside. If you got them inside and you're grabbing and holding and talk, touching, you know, you, you it's okay. But so that's what I, all I'm trying to say to you is like when you start evaluating players, you know, you put the stats aside because the stats are not a great indicator of how good that guy is. You know, it's the era they played in. And so if you're going to compare a quarterback, certainly for the last 10 years, the, last, the quarterbacks of the last 10 years, compare them to those guys. But I can tell you that some of the quarterbacks that I played and watched it play, if they had what the quarterbacks had today, which is protection, hey, they might have 30,000 passing yards. That's how good they were. Or running back. You know, if they played, my, if you could hold like that, hey, we all have at least 10,000 yards. So I'm just saying, man, uh, about the game, a beautiful game, the ultimate team sport, and you see it, you love it, you watch guys play, and and guys that you think that have done well, and I appreciate the respect you give me for giving me this phone call to interview me because that tells me, you know, I must have done something right. But, yeah, as far as my game and in my era, you know, I was the first to do it that way. But when people compare me, to the guys that played the game in my time as running back, I was a fullback. I bet you didn't know that. I did see, see it listed. Yeah, yeah, and not a halfback. No, fullback. You see what I'm saying? And so, and then you know when you look at that and see when people, are com- when people look at my game, they say, "Oh, look at his stats," and they just look at my stats from the line of scrimmage when they try to compare me to fullback or whoever. 
And one of the major parts of my game is the fact that, you know, I was so versatile, you know, that I had a part of my game that none of the other guys could do. And they don't even incorporate that in all the things that I accomplish in the game when they come to evaluate me for maybe the Hall of Fame. They don't even look at that part. They look at yards from the yards from the line of scrimmage. But the other part of my game, which separated me from everybody else, they don't even take that into consideration. So, you know, that's why I say I don't believe in all that GOAT stuff. I think, you know, I give guys the the recognition that they deserve for the successes they've had, more power to them. But then when you have people evaluating you or me or whomever as a talent, then evaluate them for the whole, not for the part that you want to evaluate them with. Thank you for listening to the Game Before the Money podcast. Special thanks to Chuck Foreman for the interview. If you're on Twitter, you can find Chuck Foreman on Twitter at Chuck Foreman. Don't forget to visit thegamebeforethemoney.com for top-notch football history articles. Transcriptions of some podcast episodes are also available at thegamebeforethemoney.com. Transcriptions are powered by our transcription partner, Sonics. S-O-N-I-X. Visit sonics.ai to learn more about their automated transcription services.